And it's exactly 12 o'clock. Well, it's 12 one. I think you're still muted. I didn't say anything, so it really didn't matter. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, you just, yeah. Uh, no, I think that's important. I think it's important that we can actually hit our hit our time and actually start the preview a little five minutes before and then start at noon. It's great. Except this is, of course, surprise Thursday astronomy cast. So, yes. You know, no one's expecting this, so. <laughs> surprise. Yeah, it's better to surprise people with science than with many of the other surprises we've gotten recently. Um, so if any, if this is the first time you've ever seen this, what we're doing is a live recording of our weekly podcast called Astronomy Cast. So we will take about half an hour to actually record the episode of the show, and then when we're finished, we will um, stick around. Not long, though. I know you've got to run, and we'll try and answer yeah. a few questions. So uh, that's going to be that's going to be what we're doing. Um, I got nothing else. Okay. Okay. Um, now, so this is going to be the fourth uh, episode in our series on space stations, the the fourth epi part of our three-part trilogy, to steal a uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy quote. Uh, now, if you want to interact with us while we're recording the episode, you totally can. Uh, there's a bunch of ways you can do that. First, if you're watching this over on Google+, Plus on the event page, you can just post a comment into the events there just below the video. Uh, if you're watching this somewhere out on the streams, on the Google Plus streams, you can post a comment there. And finally, if you are uh, watching this embedded somewhere, you can use Twitter. Um, just use the hashtag AstronomyCast and we'll catch it. Oh, not finally. And then the last and probably safest place to post a comment or question is over on YouTube. So if you're watching this video somewhere and you want to uh, make sure that we get a chance to see it, then just click to like watch the video on YouTube and then you'll see comments there and by all means, post comments there. And I've been reading some of the comments on YouTube recently, and it is both sort of wonderful and horrible. It makes you lose all faith in humanity yeah. while also loving a few rare individuals. Yeah, exactly. There are some really awful, nasty comments on YouTube. So I won't even say them. Um, okay, cool. All right, so we'll, we'll get, roll, get rolling with our recording. Okay, I am getting ready to press record. I am also and... getting ready, ready. Oh, I just thought of something. Mm -hmm. Since I'm not using headphones, my mic is going to pick up you. Say something. Uh, testing, testing. Yeah, it's picking you up. I need yeah. to use headphones, don't okay. I? Yeah, I guess so. So this this is where you learn. <laughs> Pamela left her good headphones at home today, and so yeah. was thinking she could go without. Now I'm going to use my ugly headphones. Yeah, this is where you get to look like you're actually on a space station. Mission Control. Yes. While yes. you do that, I'm going to get rid of my cell phone. <laughs> so this is more a matter of I look like I'm over miked. I've heard of overdressed, but over miked is a new one. Um, Built-in output becomes. Logic headset. Okay. Okay. You are now in my headphones. All right. Um, yeah, okay. Okay. okay I'm say pressing when. record. I am also and pressing record. It's recording. Mine is also pressing recording. It's pressing uh. it for itself. <laughs> I am I've also <laughs> pressed record. It is also <laughs> recording. We are good. Except for the auto gain. I can't seem to stop the auto gain from going up and down. So it's, it's really... what you get for using Windows. Yeah, I know. I know. That's <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stop and start the recording again. But uh, I think it's because go both Google Plus and uh, my recording software are trying to to use the. So the am audio. I stopping and going back to yeah? Zero let's stop also? and let's stop and start again. Yeah. Okay. So try three. Okay. Okay. I'm right. recording. I am also recording. Okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 299 from Monday, March 25th, 2013. Space Stations, part four, future space stations. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. How are you liking this weather? Oh my gosh, it is stunningly beautiful and stunningly allergy-inducing outside right now, but it's leading to some really great photos. So I've, I've heard a rumor that you are so sort of nervous of this that you don't even ride your horse outside. 
No, it's not that I'm nervous of this. It's it's no, I ride my horse inside because inside he can't jump out of the arena. Um and and that's a completely different fear. Right, right. Having him jump in unexpected ways. He he's mostly a good boy. But, oh, I, uh, I went on my first big mountain bike ride of the season and ruined myself. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went for like 25k and just like you know a ride that I am oh, typically that's doing. Nothing. No, I know, but typically, well, it's uphill. You know, it's up a mountain. Okay. But typically, I'm riding like that, and you know, during the middle of the season, I do that ride a couple of times a week. And yeah, first ride of the season just absolutely destroyed my legs. So yeah, I'm oh. still sore. So hopefully, I'll be I'll be back in. You know, got to get back at it. So I, I a little overdid my first one. <laughs> back. Yeah, um, I'm I'm almost ready to start riding my horse outside. I just want someone with me in case my horse decides he's terrified of sheep because he's made that decision before. It's it's a perfectly rational fear. It is. It is. All right. So sometimes the trilogy needs four parts. We've looked at the history and modern era of space stations, but now it's time to peer into the future at some space station concepts still in the works. Most of these will never fly, but the ideas are important. We can't call ourselves a true spacefaring civilization until humans live permanently outside the Earth. And I think as we were noting, you were noting as we were getting up into this, going into this episode, that I am extremely excited about this topic. <laughs> that I was throwing links at you right and left. Like, oh, we should talk about this. Oh, and these yeah. video games. And we should talk about that. Yeah, I am super excited. I, you know, as soon as we move into the world of speculation, that's when I get to my happy place. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, the realities of what we can fund sort of like takes me to the unhappy place. So I have this unfortunate habit of living within budgetary yeah. constraints. Well, you think about the, you know, like if we're like 1969, thinking about the, you know, humans have walked on the moon, the, you know, the future of space exploration is so bright. And here we are, you know, 40 years later. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, and it's just like none of that stuff happened. And so then when you think about these really cool ideas for space stations, part of you has got to just kind of go, well, how are we ever going to pay for this? It's never going to happen. Well, and, and my generation uh, growing up in the United States, we went from when we were in, in middle school. So I, I went to space camp back in 1987, year after the Challenger disaster. And... I remember seeing on one of the walls the, the plans for space station freedom. And at that point in my life, I, I still thought, well, maybe someday I'll, I'll go into space. And the, the adults who were, were training us kids were saying, oh, yeah, all of the interesting stuff will be done by the time you're old enough to go to space. And it's like, no, no, we still haven't done it. And, yeah, I'm an adult now. Thank you. And ah. it's... It, it's just too many broken dreams at a certain point. Oh, and I love that you went to space camp. That, <laughs> is, a that is awesome. <laughs> I went four times. Did you, was... go, you went four times to space camp? Do they still run space Can I take my kids to space camp? Yeah, yeah, totally. It's down uh, in Huntsville, should... Alabama. It's still going strong. Oh, we should totally do it. I will totally sign them up. They'll love it. <laughs> Did, will they like it, do you think? Yeah, 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 totally. my kids specifically. Typically, we'll probably love it. Yeah. All right. Um, so, okay. So, I think before we kind of get into the crazy, wacky concepts that I'm super excited about, uh, we should talk about sort of the near future. What What is going to sort of what will happen to this existing programs that have a sort of pretty good chance of maybe almost happening? Well, so so I think the one to really watch, the one that really is likely to happen, is the Chinese space program. They have uh, two more, um, and I'm apologizing, this falls into the category of things I will mispronounce. They have two more Tiangang um, space stations planned that are uh, basically single launch uh, capsules go up, they have their solar arrays, they're deployed. The next one that's slated to go up this year has 20 days worth of life support. Next one uh, will last a bit longer, allow multiple crews. And then after that, they're going to be working on building a multi-module space station that starts to resemble more what we're used to with Mir and the International Space Station. And uh, it's still not named. They're currently calling it the, the rather esoteric Project 921-2. Uh, but they are asking their people to brainstorm or crowdsource a new name for this future space station that they will be constructing. And so as we discussed like on the last show, looking at something that's sort of following, uh, you know, 
less the expensive. Model. Yeah, you know, like let's let's a very practical method of getting mm -hmm. these, this space station going. Learning from the lessons of what's happening with the Americans, you know, heavily yeah. using Russian hardware. But I think the long-term objective of the Chinese definitely is to reach the moon. I mean, they've stated yes. that they plan to get back. They plan to set some feet on the moon. So this is a an interesting waypoint for them. And they're they're doing this with very nice incremental design. They're not wasting their time by saying we're going to innovate everything in one step and go from zero to ten thousand ninety nine. They're instead doing the nice slow and gradual that allows them to test and innovate and test and innovate. And that's really a safer and lower cost way to do it because it's it's easier to do incremental designs than to just do the whole thing all at once. And and while they are building on the the old Salyut technology, they've completely re-innovated it, made it their own. It, it's sort of like when a country singer takes a pop rock song. Yeah, it may have some of the the old bones inside of it, some of the same chord transitions and words, but it gets completely redone in a new way. And so what they're doing really is their own innovation on the older designs. We talked about Bigelow Aerospace, their plans yeah. to build bigger and bigger inflatable habitats, eventually dock them to the space station. And then, of course, the International Space Station is going to last out until the 2020s, right? Right, that that's what we currently think, and then there's also potential plans. Uh, the the Russians and Bigelow are both looking at commercial habitats, and um, various people are talking about building things out at Earth Moon Lagrange points, orbiting the moon, and so the question is, where where are the needs and where are the dollars? So as we look towards the future, we're trying to define both how to make space exploration self-funding and also what are the things we need to do to take that next great leap in our own exploration. Well, so let's talk about the needs then. Um, you know, I think we'll avoid the dollars from here on out. There is, you know, we're in speculation land and there's no need to talk about where the money's going to come oh, from. Man. But let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about the needs. What are the sort of, why is it important for there to be space stations and what are some missions that they could do for us? That's where it starts to get very tricky because it's actually kind of hard to justify a space station beyond the peacekeeping initiative. Uh, the basic needs are to run uh, a variety of different microgravity experiments ranging from chemical reactions to crystal growth. Uh, there have always been the ideas that maybe the next great breakthrough in cancer research or in um, refined products is going to come from what we can create only under microgravity scenarios. But at, at the same time, well, why can't we just do this all in CANSATs? Why do we need human beings doing that? So where we do require basically human thumbs is fixing things on orbit. This is one of the things that the space station was, not the space station, the space shuttle was particularly good at from rescuing Solar Max and repairing it to servicing the Hubble Space Station to building the International Space Station. Um, over and over the Hubble, the, the space station over and over the space shuttle proved that human beings on orbit can grab things, fix things, and allow them to last longer and not be as expensive once you ignore some of the overpriced shuttle launch costs, uh, but not be as expensive to maintain on orbit. So you're kind of imagining the future, like a future space station being some kind of maintenance yard where... Yeah, it, where, it sounds kind of bleak, but that's what we actually need is... Yeah is that a uh, platform from which we can send out grabber robots. And, and NASA was actually working on developing these in the early 90s, spacecraft that would go out, latch onto things, and move them around. This was initially conceived of as a way to catch space junk, but it would also work to grab spacecraft, bring them back to a repair platform, and then put them back where they need to go when you're done fixing them. So. I just dropped off my computer at the repair shop shop and I, I kind of imagine that you know some like super duper crazy repair shop with tons mm -hmm. and tons of spare power systems and wiring and boards and crazy tools but for working in zero gravity you can imagine these astronauts are like one half computer techs and then one half astronauts you know test yeah. pilot test pilot slash computer techs who 
you know, beyond a certain point, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, the, the, the future repair missions will be very carefully planned out, but still, there will be this sort of need of all these parts that they can go and, and go and, and repair things. Although getting things to and from this repair station is going to be pretty complicated. I mean, the satellites have such different orbits that for them to come together, you know, be able to actually come and land on one of these or be connected to yeah. one of these space stations is going to be pretty expensive in terms of fuel, right? Well, that's where once you have something on orbit that can go and do the grabbing for you, it's not as bad. Uh, the majority of the launch cost and the majority of the energy goes into just getting out of Earth's gravity and getting into low Earth orbit. You could stick something like this perhaps in a mid-orbit, and that would give you an easy platform to have... Um, Again, helper robots go out, grab the things you need, and then put them back where they belong. With the space shuttle, we used uh, payload assistance modules of various types to raise things to higher orbits than the space shuttle could attain itself. That's that's how Chandra got into its uh, highly elliptical orbit, is it had to fire additional rockets. So it got carried off carried up, launched from the bay of the space shuttle, and then fired its own rockets to make it to where it needed to go. So this isn't that outrageous of an idea, and it does take much less fuel to just make those smaller right. variations. You can imagine there'll be one that's set in, say, um, you know, it's hanging out around the geostationary orbit, and it's just slowly moving past the geostationary ones. You can have one that's in polar orbit and one that's in, so I guess that makes sense, in a lower Earth orbit. And you can imagine sort of, you know, satellites will be launched into appropriate paths so they can be picked up and docked and repaired and upgraded and all that. That sounds great, actually. It sounds like a really good thing to, to get on. Um, then I guess the other thing is it's like it's a fuel waypoint, right? A place where you can, you know, you can have a way station where you assemble spacecraft for f further missions. Like you're going to launch all the parts up to the space station, then they get to hang out on the space station for a few days while they dock everything together and refuel it and then head off to Mars or something. And and part of that is also the construction of things on space, on, on orbit to go out into deeper space. So you can imagine it's not just a fuel depot, but it's, it's where you start assembling things, it's where things come in to be refurbished, so you can have basically that gas station in space where there's the guy in the back who's building his own cars. Yeah. And this allows us to consider, well, a lot of times when we launch rockets, the final stages make it most of the way to orbit, they could make it all the way to orbit, and there's always been plans that various people have put together as a cost saving measure to utilize those upper empty stages to start building things and right. we can do that. And also there are these free orbits that go that transfer you from planet to planet, from moon to moon. And you can imagine that once you've got a sort of spacecraft in orbit, you don't need to bring it back to any gravity well. You could right. just have it go, you know, go to Mars, drop people off, come back from Mars, dock at the space station pick up more people, go back to Mars, and just shuttling back and forth and these being these waypoint stations. So as we get more and more infrastructure in the solar system, you can imagine a greater and greater need for these waypoint space stations that will, will you know, be at these places. Yeah, it, it's kind of like the most ludicrous people mover to get on and off of rides that you ever saw at Disney World, where you have these spacecraft that are in these continual orbits that uh, resonate between Earth and Mars, and they simply are ejecting capsules and capturing capsules as they get closer to the two planets and as they depart. Uh, now it's one of those times where you can't actually stop the moving walkway because someone got stuck. Right. But it does open a much more um, continual pathway to travel between the planets. Now what about resources? I mean you can imagine in the future that we're going to want to mine asteroids. I mean there's tons of companies that are starting to look at mining asteroids and I'm sure a lot of that work's going to be done by robots. But Right. Yeah, but you could imagine a future where as well you're going to be needing to stockpile and gather these resources. Well, it, one of the issues is as you start looking at more and more of these large space station designs, they require a lot of metal. And when you start imagining, well, how do we launch that into space, you have all the fuel costs, but then you also have the 
great, now we're shipping all of the Earth's metal into space. And it's, it's not a renewable resource. So if we can get the metals we need, we can get the minerals we need by mining asteroids that saves the resources for the surface of our planet. And it also means that we don't have to expend fuel getting things off the surface of the planet, which means right. fewer greenhouse gases and fewer other wasted resources. Right, right. And so you can imagine the more and more of this infrastructure that gets built in space, the more resources they're going to need, the more they're going to be, be parking these tiny metal asteroids nearby their space stations and tearing them apart and, and so on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. man, trying to, trying to raise metal from the Earth to space is crazy talk when there's all that metal yeah. out there raining down on us, as we've seen. And and some of the space station designs that are out there are, are hundreds of thousands of tons. And that starts to become unrealistic when launching a single astronaut costs $70 million. So it's, it's a lot to, to think about. Um, it's, it's not a cheap future. And I know you want to ignore costs, but we need to get those medals from somewhere. This is, this is Fraser's mad imagination episode, and we no longer need to worry about costs. So, so let's keep <laughs> scaling this up because you can imagine, I mean, it's really this, this chicken and egg problem, but once you get this rolling, you've got, you know, you've got a repair facility, and the repair facility needs raw materials, and it needs to be able to have fuel, and then people want to have their families nearby, and so you're going to have living spaces, and so, you know, what are sort of some of the larger future space stations that are proposed? You know, a lot of these ideas, you know, came out 40 years ago, right? We saw them in, in uh, 2001. Yeah. So, so on the realistic side, we have the inflatable multi-module ships that are getting planned by organizations like Bigelow, where they're looking to use inflatables that have the lowest uh, weight per volume of any of the craft that we've been able to design. They basically have foot thick walls of a variety of different foams and uh, high tensile strength materials and uh, they seem to be fairly puncture resistant but we're still testing them out uh, and, and that really seems to be the realistic way to go. But when you start looking at the unrealistic ways to go in the near term future, there's always been that dream of the space station on which you can walk around with with regular gravity, that rotating wheel, rotating cylinder. And the reason that these are so much harder to, in practical reality, put together is they have to be huge. In, in order to get that one gravity experience for your feet, you have to build something that is tens and tens and tens of meters in, in diameter. And this is because, well, if if you try and build something that just has a 20 meter diameter, so something that is roughly um, maybe house sized for a really big house, mm -hmm. um, your feet will be experiencing normal gravity and your head will be experiencing 80% gravity. Right. And that's disconcerting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you can feel the weight of an object noticeably change as you pick it up off the ground, and oh, it's, that would it's be so cool. It would be so creepy. Yeah. Uh, it would get it, tired fast, though, for sure. It's it's yeah. only once you start to get the point that your spacecraft is 300 meters, so more than three football fields in diameter, that the, the difference between uh, your feet and as high as you can lift with your arm is, is only a couple of percent. Right, and then you can imagine the forces involved to have something that's moving fast enough at, a, you know, at 300 meters so that it's, yeah. you know, that it can hold together is going to be is going to be really tough and require even more metal and yeah and and it's tubes. also a matter of of how do you put it together and then maintain its stability so sure things that are rotating are fairly stable but you have to get it rotating without getting it wobbling and there there's a lot of complexities to getting something like this going and um 
so far we just haven't taken it on as a reality we want to consider for the future. Now, now personally, I think rather than building a, a wheel and trying to get that wheel going, Babylon 5 really had the right idea in build yourself a nice large cylinder and have the outer walls of the cylinder rotate. And in that way you can have your central zero-g region, which you're stuck with anyways, but you you have a more stable structure to begin with that's doing the rotation. And you've got other ideas where you have, like, for example, the space station and then some kind of counterweight, and everybody lives in the space station, and then there's a long cable between mm -hmm. the station and the counterweight, but but then that's very fairly difficult to kind of get to it and dock with it because you've cut all this motion going on and the, the strength of this cable. So, but, it, but in the end, I mean, you know, for us to live in, in space for any long period of time, we're going to need some level of gravity and rotation is the only feasible method of artificial gravity that we can come up yeah, with. Yeah, and, and so the question is do we need to rotate the entire space station or do we just need to, to rotate where the astronauts sleep? Because if you're just rotating where you're sleeping, you can basically build that small ride that they have at almost every, every amusement park where you get plastered against the walls to relax. Yeah. Um, and then of course there's the crazy chick screaming. But uh, that that might be more feasible, but then, of course, you have to figure out how do you not rotate everything while you're rotating the one thing, so you have to have counter-rotation and conservation of angular momentum is a pain. It, it gets tricky quickly. It's, it's all first-year physics. It's all something that any engineering student should be able to do, but turning those equations into a stable reality is a challenge. And but there were some great concepts I think you know proposed to NASA and even to just to the public back in the 1960s 1950s mm -hmm. you know and there's some great pictures on the on the internet. There there's a lot of early space art that that's dedicated to imagining that future where we all live in space and there were actually people trying to figure out how how to put cities in space. Uh, ideas ranging from the Burnell sphere to the bishop ringed the O'Neill cylinder. Let's just take care of all of the geometries. And, and in all of these different plans, they basically had a couple of core concepts. They used mirrors to get sunlight into the inside walls of their rotating architecture. Uh, they planned things so large that you could have multi-story buildings inside where people experienced um, negligible changes in gravity as they went from one level to the other. Uh, in some cases it was the rotation alone that kept in the that kept in the atmosphere so no ceiling was required. Um, in Whoa. all these cases it was a problem though that that it would really require uh, multiple asteroids worth of metal to build the realities that were being envisioned and then how do you get the dirt, how do you get the water, how do you get all the things up to build these hundreds of kilometers in size islands in space. Um, they're fabulous science fiction. We're a few hundred years off, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, some of them are just are just amazing. There's this one called the Stanford Taurus, which I'm going to try and post a picture for the people who are who are watching. Um, you know, just amazing stuff. Uh, really big. Uh, you know, in some cases, as you said, hundreds of kilometers long. That would yeah. would house h hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, these are these are serious space faring. <laughs> yeah, know, construction projects. So, uh, but that's the, as you said, that, that is the far, far future. Yeah, I, I think more in the near future, what we're looking at is let's grab ourselves an asteroid, hollow it out, and live in it. Uh, and you're the one that said this earlier today: live in it while we're mining. And this is along the lines of one of the projects that NASA currently has in its. Um, a budget as put forward by the White House. We don't know if that budget will be adopted. We don't know if this will actually move forward. But currently, there's $105 million set aside to just scope out what would be necessary to catch a near Earth object and bring it back home. And 
and that's just weird. <laughs> well, and I think that solves a lot of problems when you think about it, right? That many of these these asteroids are going to ha possibly have pockets and sources of water underneath the surface. So they're going to have a ready-made place for fuel, water, um, air. That's all going to be available. They're going to be made of metal or stone, probably, or some combination of both. So you're going to have access to you know, the kinds of resources that we require. Uh, you can dig into them so that you can hide from the radiation and from micrometeorite particles. I mean, they're a safe place to go. Uh, they've, all, you know, they can handle a certain amount of rotation probably if depending on if they're just like a, a loose ball of rock or if they're actually they have some kind of cohesion. So you could start them rotating and you could then go inside and actually create that artificial gravity. They're going to have a certain size that's that's required. So they, you know, and then eventually, if you're really feeling like you want to use them, you know, put some engines on them and hit the road. Well, and and the, the real quandary, though, is figuring out which ones are the ones to grab because you kind of described an idealistic asteroid that may not exist, one that has readily accessible water that was deposited there through some sort of comet impact or something similar, um, and also has a high metal content. Uh, most asteroids are dirt. They're minerals. They're rocks. They're interesting but they're not necessarily building materials. And trying to find those, those rare rocks that do have water that doesn't have to be taken out of minerals through some sort of horribly uh, energy-intensive chemical reaction and also has metals that are accessible in seams that are mineable. Um, we don't know how to find those objects yet. Well, you can imagine, though, you know, bring it together that you, you, know, you find the right rock and then you can bring in those little metal rocks that give you the additional metal. You can bring in, you know, something that might provide the water and ice, like a smaller comet or something like that, and just you know, crash it into it if you need to. Use that to help you with your rotation or, or, you know, but the point being that you don't need to find the one thing to, to serve all those purposes. You're going to find a good place to live and then you're also going to find and access other resources as well. So, so I think, um, this is great, but we've only just begun my sort of imagination journey. So I'd like to kind of go bigger and talk about some really cool space station concepts in, in science fiction. Now, you already talked about Babylon 5, which is, you know, you're looking at, what, a 10-kilometer long space station that rotates and provides this, this artificial gravity. Another classic one is, is from the Mass Effect video games, which is about my favorite video game series. And there's the Citadel station in that. Uh, and then, of course, everyone's talking about the Halo They've been playing the Halo video games, and I, I know you probably haven't played much Halo, but no, but I... these are these are rings that are built around worlds, and uh, and in fact, there's a um, there's a new movie coming out, oh, from Neil Blumenkamp. I forget what it's called. Someone's going to post it in, into the chat, but uh, but it's the same thing. It's like some futuristic space station in in, in orbit. And uh, and then of course there's the Ring World, right? Stories by Larry right. Niven, yeah. um, which has you know, I guess people have really taken a crack at the physics and it's come up pretty lacking. Well, yes, but yeah. yes. <laughs> and then I think the you know the the sort of grandest concept of this is like a Dyson sphere. And and that's something that we've talked about in past shows. It's it's again one of those how do you make it without having it collapse in on itself during the process of building it. Uh, it, it essentially requires you to take the mass of multiple planets and spread it out uh, into a sphere surrounding a star and that is difficult and then you have to set it spinning and you'll only have gravity um, that, that is maximal along the equator and you'll have no gravity when you get to the poles and it's, it's, again, one of those really great science fiction concepts, but the reality of, of constructing and setting something like that spinning starts to become more of a challenge. And at the end of the day, we have to remember space is mostly empty. If you try to fly through our actual asteroid belt, it's not Han Solo's asteroid belt. Yeah. You're not dodging and weaving between rocks. Uh, if you're on one asteroid, most of the time you might have a, a moon asteroid you can see, but it's not like you can see all the other asteroids in the asteroid belt. You're just on the rock you're on, sort of uh, floating like the Lonely Prince. And so trying to, to turn one asteroid into a home and then going out and grabbing others that may be vast distances away 
it's it's fuel intensive, time intensive, and a lonely prospect. So there's one concept of a space station which I didn't remember to. Oh, there you go. So someone mentioned it's Elysium by Neil Blomkamp, which is coming okay. out in August. That's the one. Um, oh, so there, there's an idea that maybe you know you might not have thought of, which is that people can use space stations as a way to communicate and as a way to demonstrate that there's alien civilizations on you know, on these stars. Right. So we, we also, I think, brought this up in the same Dyson Sphere episode a while mm -hmm. back. And, and the idea is that if you have, there, there's ideas similar to Dyson Spheres where instead of it completely enclosing a, a star, you instead have a variety of things in orbit, basically Dyson Swarm almost. A Dyson Cloud, yeah. Yeah, and this would uh, change the color of the light of the star where you'd see more infrared but lose a lot more of the optical. And so by carefully studying the spectrum and, and the continuum from stars, you might be able to see that there are these advanced uh, solar system altering civilizations out there. So far, none have been detected. People have yeah. looked. Well, we did an article on University Today about five years ago, I think, where someone proposed building almost like a mylar, a series of mylar triangles that you would you would put in orbit around your star, and it would give off a signature of light that was just absolutely, you know, a clear signal that some intelligent civilization had created this because it's not a natural formation, and yet right. it wouldn't be super expensive and might be cheaper than trying to like send messages, you know. Or receive them. Yeah, and, and that gets into the whole philosophical debate that Stephen Hawking has brought up of, do we really want to find the aliens right now? Yeah. Um, but that's a completely different topic. Yeah, well, we actually just kind of covered that one, which is with the Fermi paradox. That, yeah, that's true. You know, that, that there are very good reasons why you don't want to necessarily let the aliens know that we're here. Yes. Uh, cool. Well, I think this is great. And thank you very much for, for following into Fraser's, uh, you know, speculative mind. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, and we've wrapped up our four-part episodes on, uh, on the space station. So that was great. So who knows what we'll discuss on Monday, but we will be back with more science. But it won't be space stations. All right. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. All right. Hold on while we save. And then we could Got a few seconds to take some questions, but yeah. not not many. Um, seven minutes. -ish. Seven minutes? Okay. Seven minutes of questions. <sighs> uh, uh, I guess any idea for episode 300? Anyone? Uh, yeah, I haven't looked at our list yet today. Yeah, we have a big list, but still, if someone has an idea they want to <clears throat> they want to hear. A planet with no pollen. A planet. Oh, I will get past spring fever at some point. Just exporting mine. Uh, so Jeff Borst asks, wouldn't a Dyson sphere be like a huge oven and just keep getting hotter inside? Yeah, you'd have to have radiators. Yeah, so you'd have radiators, and this is the point, right? You'd have radiators on the, on the outside of it that would be radiating the excess energy. Yeah. And so the, the star would be bright in the infrared, not in the visible light. You would see these weird... And it would be the Dyson sphere that was bright in the infrared. Yeah, you wouldn't see the star. You would just see the, the infrared, this infrared point, which is very yeah. unusual. Uh, there was a great, uh, oh man, it's like a science fiction series. I think it was Larry Niven, something like that, where they were talking about how a cloaking f system was essentially impossible, that you couldn't put a cloaking field on a spaceship, that, that it would be pumping out so much heat, especially in the infrared. And as it yeah. was you know, decelerating towards you, you would see the, the fuel signature, the heat signature of the, of the infrared as it was coming towards you, that there'd be no way to, to hide. I, I don't know, maybe I'm kind of getting curmudgeon -y, but so many <laughs> of the really good ideas in science fiction were th already thought of back yes. in like the 50s and the 60s. Well, it's we're amazing getting... to me. We're getting some novel takes on things from like John Scalzi, or he's taking old ideas and making them new again. Um, but I, th I think where people are starting to consider the full implications of 3D printing, that that, that is, is changing how we imagine the future. Because yes, we'd, we'd 
thought of the Star Trek replicator technology, but now we have actual 3D printers, and now that it's a reality, people are, are having to think through the ethical and, and moral consequences much more than they had to before. Well, it's just crazy. I mean, when you think about things like, like the on the Star Trek, well, in the old show, right, they had their their tricorder and then in the, yeah. in the new show they had these pads that they used right yeah. you know and when we were first we were like, there <laughs> we were I was like oh that would be so great if I could have a small device that I would use to access you know the sum of humanity oh and now we have them and now they're smaller yes. and, and and shortly they're about to be projected into your eyeball with you know Google Glass or you know a little yeah. screen in front of your eye that that these technologies are coming so fast, and I like I regularly communicate with my computer by voice now. Really? Oh, Google, oh yeah, yeah. Use Google now, Google Voice Search. It's all. It's even on okay. iOS. You're like, you know, I you pose questions all the time, and it's just boom, comes back with the answer. Yeah, all the time. And like when you're navigating, turn by turn navigation, and you, your your phone yeah. is telling you turn right, turn left. Yeah, we're there. So like, what on earth does the future hold? I I have no idea. Genetic engineering, that's going to be the interesting Yeah, but that'll one. be like, again, that'll be like, you know, three weeks. You know, it'll be like, we go, we've we just started to do genetic engineering. Now everyone can do genetic engineering. Now there's millions of genetic engineering going on every minute. You know, like it's just like the, the advance of this technology. There was a really good, um, there's an essay, I think it was on io9. It was a couple of years back, but they were saying that essentially, or people on Wired, that that the this concept of the technological singularity, that the technology is just going to move faster and faster and faster, has made yeah. science fiction really hard to write because we're yes. clearly moving towards this future where, where the technology is just going to start increasing at an exponential rate, and we're just like I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. Ask the ask the computers who mm -hmm. live in that future because it's a mystery to me. What what gets me is. Why don't we have decent 3D goggles yet? So I I the want the Oculus Rift. It's done. This problem has been solved. But but they're they're not okay. Th this is the difference between having mainstream commercial as easy to get as the headset I'm wearing to hear you. Um, why 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 aren't we to the point that it's more natural for me to go into? Uh, my 3D environment with my glasses and then just surround myself with multiple computer monitors. Oculus Rift. Just like this tech, this is a great Kickstarter. The reviews have been tremendous. They're, you know, and their first ones are going to be kind of expensive, but now that they've kind of figured out this technology, I'm sure in the next couple of years you're going to see them cheaper. Okay. And cheaper, yeah. I, I want my Oculus snow Rift. crash. Are you Googling it right now? Yeah. The virus. Yeah. This problem has been solved. Um, but yeah, no, so anyway, that's the, you know, and so I mean, part of my brain is always, uh, always thinking about that when I'm like imagining these rotating wheels in space and things like that, you know. The, the realist in you is like, well, you know, the technology, yeah. or the, it's going to be so expensive, we'll never get a chance to pay for it. And for me, it's just like our concept on what we want in a mission profile will have changed with, as you said, with 3D printers, with high-speed computers with intel you know with a certain amount of 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 artificial intelligence that we're going to be yeah. putting on these things you know i mean really is a hand it's a monkey with its opposable thumbs really the best tool for flying out in space and right. part an asteroid and yeah well read read the the old man wars um I've read by them. john okay yeah, yeah that the whole idea of completely refashioning the human body to interact mentally with computers and to be physically adapted to live in outer space. It's, it's fascinating and terrifying all at yeah. once. Uh, Martin uh, Taika Takaichi says, uh, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. That's by <laughs> William Gibson, right? Yes. Which is a great classic quote. And, and I have to admit, we don't always realize how behind we are here in, in North America, uh, I was reading an article the other day. They now are using robots to chop noodles in China. There, there's robots that are used to read children's stories in Japan. Um, robots, I guess we're more Cylon oriented here in the United States where we're a little bit more fearful of, of our um, electronic overlords. Um, 
but it, it's going to be interesting to see how things get modified in the future as as um, cybernetics becomes a thing. Yeah, no kidding. Well, those are 12.45, so I think you've got to yeah. run. And uh, so I will let you go. So thanks, okay. everybody, for watching us. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be doing the Weekly Space Hangout, I guess. Yep. That's the plan. Um, I'm in. So I don't know yet. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then on Sunday night, we'll do our virtual star party. So that's what's coming okay. up. Awesome. Okay. All right. Sounds See you later, good. Pamela. We'll thanks, everyone, later. for watching. And uh, thanks for letting us catch up and watch us do it. So, all right. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.